So tea and welcome everyone to our weekly study session. And before we start, we will take the precepts together, the five precepts. Aham bante ti saranena saha pancha silani yachani. Duti ampi aham bante ti saranena saha pancha silani yachani. Tati ampi aham bante ti saranena saha pancha silani yachani. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. 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 Buddhang saranam gachami. Buddhang saranam gachami. Dhammang saranam gachami. Dhammang saranam gachami. Sanghang saranam gachami. Sanghang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranam gachami. Tati ampi buddhang saranam gachami. Tati ampi buddhang saranam gachami. Tati ampi dhammang saranam gachami. Tati ampi dhammang saranam gachami. Tati ampi sanghang saranam gachami. Tati ampi sanghang saranam gachami. Ti saranagamanang ititang. Ama bante. Pana tipata we ramani sikha padang samadiyami. Pana tipata we ramani sikha padang samadiyami. Adina dana we ramani sikha padang samadiyami. Adina dana we ramani sikha padang samadiyami. Kami su mitchaha chara we ramani sikha padang samadhyami. Kami su mitchaha chara we ramani sikha padang samadhyami. Mosa vada we ramani sikha padang samadhyami. Mosa vada we ramani sikha padang samadhyami. Sura meraya manja pamada tana. We ramani sikha padang samadhyami. Sura meraya manja pamada tana. We ramani sikha padang samadhyami. Imani pancha sikha padani. Sile na sukating yanti. Sile na bhoga sampada. Sile na nibuting ang titas masilang isodaye. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Sadu, sadu, sadu. We will continue our study of the Wisudi Maga and going on with chapter 1, the Sila Nidesa, Description of Virtue. The meaning of this text should be understood as follows. Firstly, as regards the description of scheming on the part of one bent on gain, honor and renown is on the part of one who is bent on gain, on honor and on reputation. On the part of one who longs for them is the meaning of one of evil wishes, of one who wants to show qualities that he has not got. A prey to wishes. The meaning is of one who is attacked by them. 
And after this, the passage beginning, or by what is called rejection of requisites, is given in order to show the three instances of scheming given in the Mahanidesa as rejection of requisites, indirect talk, and that based on deportment. So rejection of requisites is by someone who uh, thinks quite reasonably that if they present themselves as only receiving the, the, the barest minimum of requisites or if they present themselves as someone who is austere, they're likely to get support. So it's okay to be austere, but it, it, it this relates to what the scheming of the person who is doing it in order to to be appreciated. So it's it's obviously a, a futile. It's it's not a a practice that's going to help them on their path. Indirect talk is I think we met we talked about that is where you. Um, I think it's just where you, where you say, oh, someone in this monastery is an iron hunt or something like that, where you or you make hint hints at being enlightened or hints at having. Which you'll, what's quite common is you'll have people you have monks hinting at um, having magical powers or something like that, right? Because you can hint at. Where did I read this? Uh, I think I think Mahasi Sayada was the one who said where he told an example of a monk who says someone in this monastery is thinking someone in this he's giving a talk and says someone in this hall is having i can i can sense them having unwholesome thoughts or something and he said well obviously someone's going to be having unwholesome thoughts so that kind of that, that probably relates to this sort of indirect talk and deportment is pretending to be enlightened by walking slowly and so on, by doing all things that are generally good, but doing them for false, under false pretenses or for immoral uh, reasons, doing them because you are greedy and because you feel like if, if you do that, people are going to respect you. And it's true. It's, it's certainly, in the short term anyway, it's certainly material of material benefit to act in that way. And it's so it, it's a very valuable teaching because even good monks are going to fall prey to this. You're going to fall prey to wanting people to, you know, craving requisites and liking when people appreciate you. And before you realize it, you're you're acting in such a way that you're at, you're you're acting in a good way simply for the purpose of hoping that people give you better food or something like that. You know? Talk about the rejection of the requisites. Is that also like this pretense? It's where you reject uh, reject the requisite. But why? Because when you it may not seem quite obvious, but when uh, for a monk, yeah, I guess I didn't explain in detail. Uh, when a monk rejects the requisites, people think, "Oh, look at this monk. He's frugal. He's austere. He doesn't accept all these." Ex, this extra food, extra robes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, the, generally, these things, deportment as well, well, deportment anyway, is uh, these are these are good things. But the thing is, no act that you do, whether it be the rejection or acceptance of requisites, or whether it be your deportment or anything, is either wholesome or unwholesome. It's all in the mind. So it's of great detriment to have a mind to do things out of a mind that is greedy. And so again, I think we're talking here about right livelihood, right? This is this would be a wrong livelihood. Bhante, is this the break of sila? Yes. Just having some different intention is a break of sila. Doing things with the wrong intentions. Doing things a manipulative in order to get uh, benefit. Remember livelihood, right? How you get the, the requisites that you need, the things you need, and by extension, the things that you want and may not need. So anything that you get that is just because you want it and not because you need it, for a monk, that's wrong livelihood. Or no, let's not say that's it's it's wrong to seek that out. But even the things that you need to seek them out uh, in ways that are inappropriate, like. Uh, 
puffing yourself up or promoting yourself or doing something that makes you look good, thinking this will get me better requisites. That's all wrong livelihood. So it's sila, one of the four, four types of sila, which is what we're talking about now, is right livelihood. And right livelihood for a monk just means it's generally accepting whatever you get. Unless you're sick. Thank you. 67. Herein, a bhikkhu is invited to accept robes, etc. And precisely because he wants them, he refuses them out of evil wishes. And then, since he knows that those householders believe in him implicitly when they think, Oh, how few are our Lord's wishes. He will not accept a thing. And they put fine robes, etc. before him by various means. He then accepts, making a show that he wants to be compassionate towards them. It is this hypocrisy of his which becomes the cause of their subsequently bringing them even by cartloads that should be understood as the instance of scheming called rejection of requisites. 68. For this is said in the Mahani Desa, what is the instance of scheming called rejection of requisites? Here householders invite bhikkhus to accept robes, arms, food, arms, food, resting place and the requisite of medicine as cure for the sick. One who is of evil wishes a prey to wishes, wanting robes, arms, food, resting place, the requisite of medicine as cure for the sick, refuses robes, arms, food, resting place, the requisite of medicine as cure for the sick, because he wants more. He says, what has an ascetic to do with expensive robes? It is proper for an ascetic to gather rags from a carnal ground, or from a rubbish heap, or from a shop, and make them into a patchwork cloak to work, wear. What has an ascetic to do with expensive arms food? It is proper for an ascetic to get his living by the dropping of lumps of food into his bowl while he wanders for gleanings. What has an ascetic to do with an expensive resting place? It is proper for an ascetic to be a tree root dweller or an open air dweller. What has an ascetic to do with an expensive requisite of medicine as cure for the sick? It is proper for an ascetic to cure himself with putrid urine and broken gall nuts. Accordingly, he wears a coarse robe eats coarse arms food, uses a coarse resting place, uses a coarse re requisite of medicine as cure for the sick. Then householders think, this ascetic has few wishes, is content, is secluded, keeps aloof from company, is strenuous, is a preacher of cesticism. And they invite him more and more to accept robes, arms, food, resting places, and the requisite as of medicine as cure for the sick. He says, we three things present a faithful clansman, produces much merit. With faith, present a faithful clansman, produces much merit. With goods to be given present, a faithful clansman produces much merit. With those worthy to receive present, a faithful clansman produces much merit. You have faith. The goods to be given are here, and I'm here to accept. If I do not accept, then you will be deprived of the merit. That is no good to me. Rather, will I accept out of compassion for you. Accordingly, he accepts many robes, he accepts much alms food, he accepts many resting places, he accepts many requisites of medicine as cure for the sick. Such grimacing, grimacery, scheming, schemery, schemedness is known as the instance of scheming called rejection of requisites.
What is Mahanidesa? Yeah. Nidesa is a text in the Kundaka Nikaya, I think. Is Mahanidesa in some some text? Kudaka Nikaya? It's in the Kudaka Nikaya. I, I I don't think there's an English translation of that one though, but it, it would be a uh, a commentary on the Sutta Nipata, and then there's also the Kula Nidesa. Nidesa means uh, summary, right? Outline. I think it's the the opposite. It's a uh, detailed analysis. If it's going into detail. I was just wondering, like, how would you, how can you tell that they have this uh, schema in, in in their mind? Because I mean, other than themselves, we would not know, right? Yeah, but it's not about you. It's about them. Or it's about you if you're the monk. Mm -hmm. So we we don't. I mean, we can't like just ask for like don't behave this or that way because we don't know for sure, right? Well, why would you anyway? Yeah. It's only your business. Okay, thank you. There is an inconsistency in this paragraph, Dante. Really? I have the because saying. The Riku is saying not to use any expensive items and he's not wearing them, he's not using them, but he's accepting them. And what he's going to do with those expensive items? Well, he's going to wear them and use them. And then the lay followers will like his... figure out. No, he builds up a, rep he builds up a rep reputation. But then he says, well, I guess I can't keep doing this because everyone's offering and I wouldn't want to, out of compassion for you, I'll start wearing these. And gullible people would be convinced by that. And then if anyone said, hey, this isn't a real monk, he's wearing all these fine robes, they would say, oh, he's only wearing it. He used to wear the coarsest of robes, but out of compassion for us, he has accepted these. I mean, it's just one example of scheming. It's not like this is how they always do it, but it's a pretty gross example. Okay, thank you. I mean, it's it's it, it's not this elaborate usually, but it is quite common for excuses to be made. Oh, yes, it's true that we're using all these luxurious things, but people offered them and we have to accept. And, and you know, it, it's, it's a fine, it's an interesting argument, but the real question is, is that really why they're accepting? Are they really, they really don't have any desire or greed or craving for these things? And they wouldn't say it immediately before they accept it. They would teach it maybe at some place where it doesn't have to do anything with the situation. But then there they maybe do it exactly at a point where they would receive something, about to receive something. Well, often what you'll hear is anytime anyone criticizes them or anytime anyone says, uh, sort of, asks if it's right to take these things and so on. Uh, you know, it's quite common now to say that uh, monks have to accept everything lay people give them, which is not true at all. But uh, it, it's become kind of cultural here where, where in certain circles they really do believe that and they'd be insulted if a monk turns them down and monks will say it's wrong to turn down lay people, that sort of thing. The real, the real scary thing is if you turn people down, then maybe they won't give, they won't even think to give you next time. So you just accept everything because otherwise, maybe they'll stop giving. I mean, that's not a good thing, but it's not a good way to think. But it seems to be a part of the corrupted way of thinking. Monk has to be content and content with little and careful. You have to be careful to to not get too luxurious. It's not really compassionate to accept things that are not really appropriate for monks. It's all basically helping to restrain the greed for the monk, to help them not to get greedy, to greedy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the point here is asking yourself, uh, what are your intentions and how are you living your life and that sort of thing. I mean, it's, it's quite detailed. This is not like, uh, oh, this monk did this, he's not a good monk, or he's a 
he's no longer a monk or he's not a real monk or something like that. This is this is detailed stuff, right? This is advice. This isn't so that we can judge them and say that's a bad monk, that's a good monk, and so on. This is for monks to read and to think about and to consider, oh yeah, my livelihood's not entirely pure, I'm greedy and I con people into giving me things and I I am manip- I'm kind of manipulative, not not like in an evil, evil way, but I do try to present put put my best what do you call it? put my best foot forward or whatever, try to make myself look in the best light so that and I do it because I want people to give me things, right? This is for contemplation. This is this is practice. And it's not easy. It's uh, this is like this is the kind of thing you'd expect from even monks who are trying to be good monks. This is what the sorts of struggles they would have. Realizing, oh yeah, I really do want these things, and I'm kind of uh, doing things to get what I want, and that sort of thing. Doing things to get what you want. This is sort of sums it all up. What what the Buddha, what Buddhism sh- shows is wrong with the world. We do things to get what we want. And I wanted to say because sometimes we do similar things without even knowing. So we manipulate in a way, but we don't notice it immediately. We think it's okay to act like this, but then maybe afterwards we notice, oh, I wasn't being honest or true there, and just try to get something out of. How I acted. Doing uh-huh. things to get what you want is uh, basically upada and pachya bhava in paticca sampada. In the beginning, you might not want these things, but if people are pushing it on you, uh, then I mean that's also a possibility that you did not want it from the beginning, but maybe after a while you grow to want it. No. Yeah, I don't think that's as big of a concern. Sure, it could happen, but much more common for you to crave certain things, especially as a monk, that you don't get anymore. And uh, it's just old cravings that are not being fulfilled, and you find ways to fulfill them. Can you develop new cravings? Yeah, I suppose so. Can monks develop cravings they didn't have before? Well, of course, yes, but is it common? I don't. I can't think how common that is. There's not a lot to the monk's life that will be new that you would crave. I mean, you just crave the same old things: food, taste, um, comfort. I just, I just mean that in the beginning, you might not think about what they're uh, offering even because you think you, you don't need it basically and then they are keep pushing <laughs> to offer it and maybe you just change your mind so i'm i'm just saying that could be not scheming from the get go or something or right scheming. but here it's talking about scheming that's that's what this is but, yes of yeah. course, and in fact, you can accept all these things. What the, the idea here is that all of these things are okay to accept. But did you did did the getting of them involve any scheming? That's where it goes wrong. Sure. This reminds me of a well-respected monk here who, when uh, uh, lay people are offering him dana, he's he's I think he's vegetarian, but. Uh, he doesn't uh, reject uh, when they offer like meat and fish. So because if he rejects, then there's pressure on the, the younger monks to reject as well because our um, teacher rejected. So he accepts it, but then uh, keep it aside. So <laughs> there's no pressure on the other student, other monks. Sometimes. Uh... I've heard of Sri Lankan communities where uh, when a monk accepts meat, they try to kick him out. Really? Where, where is that? Monk? That's not In Buddhism. Canada, it happened. Yeah, I know, but there's, there, are, there are groups that, that believe. I think, doesn't um, Mahamevana believe in vegetarianism, or am I wrong? Uh, Maybe I'm wrong. I don't right? know I about that, that, but uh, Mahamevana is one of the... Uh, of yeah, the they're a little bit... Yeah. yeah, they're 
But there was one group. I think I think it's maybe Mahameona that they believe in vegetarianism and they try to spread it. At one group anyway. And yeah, so these people were they were saying this monk is wrong and he sh even eggs. I think it was eggs actually. He was eating eggs and they thought, oh, this is a bad monk, and they tried to get him kicked out. <laughs> I think the, the problem with Mahameona was that they rejected Abhidhamma, like they started like a sutta only. Franchise. I see. Are they? Did they also reject the Visuddhi Magga? Is that the group? Because there's many yeah, in yeah. Sri Lanka who. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, we've only just scratched the surface of this book, and I hope everyone can appreciate how valuable it is so far. So many new groups here, but they like. Rejecting Visuddhi Magga, rejecting commentaries, Abhidhamma, so unfortunate. Yeah, it's a new, it's a brand new trend. Yeah. And I always wonder, like, do you think you're wiser than the, you know, the thousands of years old monks? I mean, be the time before. Yeah, I get it. I it often feels like there's there's people who don't realize that they are just replacing the commentaries with their own commentary. Which is way, po the question of way more polluted than um, the monks that uh, had like a right. pure teaching already. Are, are you better than the than Buddha Gosa? They, they, they think they are. I mean, and it's not to say that that's not possible. It's just, I don't think, we don't, we don't think it's possible. <laughs> it's not likely. And also the commentaries are coming from, not just uh, from Venerable Buddha Ghost, it, they are coming from the first uh, Buddhist council. It's, in, it's there in the commentary itself written, coming from the Arahants who participated there. So, like, are we going to accept your version of the Sutta? We don't know, you know whether you are an Arahant or not. It sounds, it sounds reasonable. Someone says, okay, Buddhism went astray, we're going to try to straighten it and go back. And it sounds kind of like, okay, well, that's a reasonable thing. Maybe it happened. Maybe it's possible that the com I mean, they, it, they'll, they'll tell you the story of how the commentaries went astray and added things that weren't in line with the suttas and so on. And you think, okay, well, if that happened, we really should go back. But when you start to investigate, or when, when I start to investigate, I don't feel convinced at all, either A, that the commentaries went astray, or B, that these guys are 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 in any way straighter. It it's usually feels like they're more crooked. And I'm not saying that the, I feel the commentaries are crooked at all. I don't really get that sense from the commentaries from the Siddhi Maga. But you do kind of get that sense from the people who claim to be straightening them out. When you investigate it, it starts to feel like oh, these guys are kind of biased and crooked. Not crooked in a dishonest way, but their understanding is not straight. I, I remember um, one, one video you did, Bonte, that, that re really stuck with me that that kind of helped with thinking through those issues. And it was when you talked about with, uh, you know, people trying to trace things back to the historic Buddha or ask, you know, was the historic Buddha really enlightened? And your answer was, it's not about, you know, the historic Buddha, whether, you know, what he achieved or what was really said by him it's about the teachings and investigating them and seeing you know whoever understood this and taught this really understood where these things lead and you know whoever practices them correctly and diligently can get the same result and it's about uh, understanding things in that way and where they lead as opposed to the historic origin and that that i always thought was a really really great way of looking at it Right, so the, the this is this is in my mind the best um, evidence for the Abhidhamma being the teaching of the Buddha. Just read it, just ch even just chant it, as I was saying. You know, just just chant it, even if you don't understand it. Well, okay, if you don't understand it, it's not as valuable. But even just understanding the words and maybe not getting like having an explanation of it all. It's it's just so there's something very ancient about it. Yes. Something that resonates with I think people who have been Buddhists in their past lives have sort of have this feeling of 
how authentic it is and how pure and precious it is. It's very self-evident. Even if it's only Sariputta's teaching, I'm I I was just over the moon <laughs> to learn it. But I think the best thing is we don't have to convince anyone. It's here for us, and we can just keep for ourselves. So yeah, that's well said, and and we we don't have to feel superior. We we, we should very be careful not to feel like these kind of conversations often feel like it's an they call it an echo chamber right like we all agree and we can puff ourselves up and think huh i'm i'm on the right path or look at me better than all these other people that you have to be really careful with but if if we sit back and we listen to what these people say and listen to what people say when they reject these things and then we can ask ourselves are they right remember what the buddha said in uh, in the Brahma Jala Sutta, he said, don't get angry when people criticize the Buddha or the Dhamma or the Sangha, don't get angry. And when they praise the Buddha, the Dhamma, Sangha, don't get, a, don't get happy. Don't like that. Because either way, you're not going to be able to have a clear mind to tell what is right and what is wrong. I did wonder if they ever read it. So did they read the Abhidhamma before rejecting it or just what they what they generally reject is the theory behind both say the Visuddhi Maga and the uh, the Abhidhamma, just as examples. Because they they you hear people like Mahasi Sayad or they read like people like Mahasi Sayad or or whoever explaining a certain take on meditation. And they disagree with that take, and they understand that it comes from the Visuddhimagga, and they read maybe the parts in the Visuddhimagga to see that it comes from the Visuddhimagga, and that's where the problem lies. It's not what we're reading today, these specifics. I think most of people who reject it would appreciate these bits and pieces, at least. But they don't reject what they call the Abhidhamma method, or the Visuddhimagga method, or something like that. So they, it's the framework that it poses generally around meditation and mostly around the jhanas, from what I've seen. It is hypocrisy on the part of one of evil wishes who gives it to be understood verbally in some way or other that he has attained a higher than human state. That should be understood as the instance of skimming called indirect talk. According as it is said, what is the instance of scheming called indirect talk? Here someone of evil wishes, a prey to wishes, eager to be admired, thinking, thus people will admire me, speaks words about the noble state. He says, he who wears such a robe is, is a very important ascetic. He says, he who carries such a bowl, metal cup, water filler, water strainer, key, wears such a waistband, sandals, is a very important ascetic. He says, he who has such a preceptor, teacher, who has the same preceptor, who has the same teacher, who has such a friend, associate, intimate, companion, he who lives in such a monastery, lean to mansion, villa, cave, grotto, hut, pavilion, watchtower, hall, barn, meeting hall, room, at such a tree root is a very important ascetic. Or alternatively, all gushing, all grimacing, all skimming, all talkative, with an expression of admiration, he utters such deep, mysterious, cunning, obscure, supramundane talk, suggestive of voidness as this ascetic is an obtainer of peaceful abidings and attainments such as this. Such grimacing, grimacery, skimming, skimmery, skimmedness is known as the instance of skimming called indirect talk. It is hypocrisy on the part of one of evil wishes 
which takes the form of deportment influenced by eagerness to be admired that should be understood as the instance of scheming dependent on deportment. According as it is said, quote, what is the instance of scheming called deportment? Here someone of evil wishes, a prey to wishes, eager to be admired, thinking, thus people will admire me, composes his way of walking, composes his way of lying down. He walks studiedly, stands studiedly, sits studiedly, lies down studiedly. He walks as though concentrated, stands, sits, lies down as though concentrated, and he's one who meditates in public. Such disposing, posing, composing of deportment, grimacing, grimacery, scheming, schemery, schemedness, is known as the instance of scheming called deportment. End of quote. Deportment here means behavior. Kind of. How you present yourself. It's not quite behavior. It's uh, the manner in which you behave, I guess. Not a word we use much. Here in the words by what is called rejection of requisites mean by what is called thus rejection of requisites. Or they mean by means of the rejection of requisites that is so called. By indirect talk means by talking near to the subject. Of deportment means of the four modes of deportment, postures. Disposing is initial posing or careful posing. Posing is the manner of posing. Composing is prearranging, assuming a trust inspiring attitude is what is meant. Grimacing is making grimaces by showing great intenseness. Facial contraction is what is meant. One who has the habit of making grimaces is a grimacer. The grimacer state is grimacery. Scheming is hypocrisy. The way, ayana, of a schemer, kuha, is schemery. Kuhayana. The state of what is schemed is schemedness. 72. In the description of talking, talking ad is talking that's on seeing people come into the monastery. What have you come for, good people? What to invite? Because if it is that, then go along and I will, I shall come later with my ball, etc. Or alternatively, Talking at is talking by advertising oneself as Amtisa, the king trusts me, such and such, his ministers trust me. Talking is the same kind of talking on being asked a question. Talking around is roundly talking by one who is afraid of householder's displeasure because he has given occasion for it. Talking up is talking by extolling people as he's a great land owner, a great ship owner, a great lord of giving. Continue talking up is talking by extolling people in all ways. Persuading is progressively involving people, thus, lay followers, forming, formerly you used to give first fruit alms at such time. Why do you not do so now? Until they say, we shall give, venerable sir, we have had no opportunity, etc. Entangling is what is meant. Or alternatively, seeing someone with sugar cane in his hands, he asks, where are you coming from, lay follower? From the sugar cane field, venerable sir. Is the sugar cane sweet there? One can find out by eating, venerable sir. It is not allowed, play follower for Bikus to say, give me some sugar cane. Such entangling talk from such an entangler is persuading. Persuading again and again in all ways is continual persuading. So yeah, these sorts of examples, obviously, 
it's very strict for monks, but you can certainly appreciate how this is applicable to lay people as well. You can see this amongst lay people in, in, in all manner of activities where we manipulate, where people manipulate each other and out of a desire for gain of some sort. We will scheme and talk, talk for the purpose of gain. I was wondering, what's the teaching for a lay follower from this passage? Well, the teaching is to not be greedy and not try to manipulate people or uh, find ways for other people to give you things. Like, suppose you see someone eating something and you say, oh, that looks good. Thinking that uh, maybe by saying that you can hint at them giving you some of it. Oh, I love those. But what if there is no intention, like just a small talk? Hmm. Then it's not, then it wouldn't be considered scheming. But there are cases where there is scheming. Where you see someone eating and you think, oh, if I say this, then maybe they'll give me something. Mm -hmm. uh, an example, a, a really example that you see quite often is how uh, rich parents when they get older, their their uh, children will sometimes try to manipulate the parents into giving them more of their inheritance or something like that. When parents get sick and then the children all try to ingratiate themselves with the parents. That's a common extreme example. Thank you, Vante. I think uh, some people even accuse monks of... Uh, uh, Preaching the Dakinavi Banka Sutta <laughs> so they can get more requisites. That's a good example. Yeah. Like it, it is true. As an as a newcomer to Buddhism, it's quite remarkable how often those sorts of teachings get taught. And you sometimes get a little suspicious that there's a bit of a emphasis on giving. What was the, the Sutta mentioned? I think we covered it uh, in one of our study groups. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you know? Uh, uh, okay. Could you put put it in the chat? Possibly? Yeah, sure. Hey, thank you. Thank you. In the last paragraph, it's also making the layperson uh, feel bad or putting pressure on them if you tell them something like this, maybe. Oh yeah, you can feel how unpleasant and immoral it is. 74. Suggesting is insinuating by specifying thus. That family alone understands me. If there is anything to be given there, they give it to me only. Pointing to is what is meant. And here the story of the oil seller should be told. Suggesting in all ways, again and again, is continual suggesting. 75. Creating chatter is endearing chatter repeated again and again without regard to whether it is in conformity with truth and dhamma. Flattery is speaking humbly, always maintaining an attitude of inferiority. Being superi is resemblance to bean soup, for just as when beans are being cooked, only a few do not get cooked, the rest get cooked. So too, the person in whose speech only a little is true, the rest being false, is called a bean soup. His state is bean supery. Fondling is the state of the act of fondling. For when a man fondles children on his lap or on his shoulder like a nurse, he nurses, is the meaning. That fondler's act is the act of fondling. The state of the act of fondling is fondling. I have a question about uh, paragraph 75. So it says that flattery is like, you know, obviously not a good thing. But um, when you want to practice, say, metta, when talking to someone who is, for example, very mean and cruel, um, how do we do that without actually getting into flattery? Well, through mindfulness. 
remember these are just talking about doing it for the purpose of of gain so it's not that being humble is is a problem there is a lot of false humility for various reasons sometimes false humility is out of conceit actually you feel good about yourself for being so humble for example thank you and finally the explanation for being super is this what we thought it is no it wasn't what i originally thought it was yeah i mean either <laughs> at all it, it was written in the chat i think at the time when we were talking yeah, about it. we did look it up but it's very interesting what what uh, examples they give sometimes i mean i, I would have never thought of that one question I had, paragraph 71, where it talks about the um, the facial contraction and and like the, the, the grimacing and, and so forth. I know there's certain things in um, the Abhidhamma associated with smiling and facial expressions. Is there anything particular about, you know, like the kind of opposite facial expressions? Expression of the, the 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 frowning and and facial contraction is there, there's some kind of significance there as well. Well, pleasant facial expressions are usually related to sensual pleasures. So a person who's grimacing, the idea that they are free from those frivolous uh, activities pursuits mm. Mm. oh this is someone who has let go of all that he's not seeking out pleasure he's uh, very serious about life mm. taking, taking 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 his practice seriously mm. so i mean it's not always going to be like that some people will be very critical of monks who are not smiling <laughs> And they want to see monks smiling. It depends on the person. You get accused, you get criticized for grimacing, you get criticized for smiling. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. in this world, it's, it's not criticized. Yeah. One of the worldly conditions, but pra praise and blame, praise and blame. Don't 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 get caught up in either one. But yeah, that, that that's an interesting thing to think about. To like the, the the facial expressions and stuff and how, how people are perceived because that was actually one of the things that I I noticed very early on studying Buddhism is a lot of um, uh, monks especially like the more senior ones they'd have this very specific facial expression where I, I don't know how to describe it but if you like look at a picture of someone like uh, Mahasi Sayadaw or something it's like they're the the, cor the corners of their mouth are pulled all the way back, not like smiling or frowning, just very kind of stoic facial expression. For, for some reason, that always kind of struck me as just an interesting thing. Like when you're reading someone's emotions, just a, a lot of monks, very, very kind of neutral, stoic look on their face. So I, was, I always wondered about that. Yeah, smiling is uh, okay. I mean, even Arahant's uh, smile, but laughing is not suitable for monks. Smiling is pretty common. Even the Buddha very rarely smiled, but that's for a different reason, not the reason we think it may be usually. Why is fo fodling? I mean, uh, in the others, uh, they presented like it was uh, the mind inten intention that it was not in alignment with the acting. But but from that point of view, I, I don't can't quite understand the fodling, the last paragraph we read. Um, why why is that bad? Uh, because of how the parents look at it. It's ingratiating yourself with the parents. Okay. They think, oh, this monk is, this monk is uh, giving some attention to our children and parents who love their children uh, like that. They like to see people pay attention to their kids. They like to see their kids being made happy and so on. And so they 
the monk knows this and so he does it and then the lay people think, oh, this monk loves us and we love this monk. And so they give that monk more gifts. That happens, for sure. And it's a good, uh, good reminder, monks should not fondle children. <laughs> I mean, okay, that sounded awful. The other word, use, the, this word fondling is often used in a, in a sexual way. So, when, yeah. But, but that's not how it's used here. Here it just means like patting them on the head, bouncing them on your knee, doing things that parents do with their kids. Monks should not do those things. Bhante. Um, according to the English dictionary, the ingratiating means charming, agreeable, pleasing. Can you say if agreeable agreeableness is good or bad? So ingratiating means doing something that makes people like you. That's how we understand it, generally speaking. That's how it should be understood here. So you're doing things for the express purpose of making people um, positively inclined towards you. In other words, specifically here, making people want to give you things. So you praise people without thinking of whether it's true. I mean, praising other people is generally uh, valuable good to be to appreciate each other and that sort of thing but when it's done for the purpose of ingratiation then it's and especially he points out here that it's often false it's often has no no relation to the truth or no relation to it being a, an actual appreciation of good qualities so some a monk might say Oh, you're so handsome, or you're so beautiful. Oh, your hair looks good like that, or that's. Oh, did you cut your hair? <laughs> this sort of thing. Not not that common for monks to say, but not not completely unheard of for monks to go that that far. Monks who praise uh, food, for example. Oh, this is so well cooked. You did such a good job with this food. That sort of thing. Monks who go to a person's house and say, "Oh, your house is so." this or so that I, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever heard that but it could be possible that a monk goes to a lay person's house and says oh I love what you've done with the place I, I don't think I've ever heard such a thing but these kind of ingratiations that's where he says no, no respect for the Dhamma meaning it's true that they've worked hard at that sort of thing but and it's a terrible thing to say be, for a monk because it's promoting things that are not related to the Dhamma, like, oh, your hair looks good like that, or that sort of thing. Thank you, Gante. When you praise people, it shouldn't be making with the idea, oh, this way they will like me. You should do it because it's a, the right thing to say, and it's a valuable thing to say, and because uh, it will help that person to feel more confident for themselves and that sort of thing. Speaking of praise, the, um, the YouTube videos for these have gotten praise, so much appreciation for the people who are making those. I, I didn't, I mean, I observed that uh, there are not many uh, views on them. So it's around in the hundreds, basically. So I'm just curious mm. if, if they are viewed or studied or... Well, I know some hey. people are viewing them. Great. I was going to say, well, one one of my friends from the, the temple here, he, he's been watching them, and he, he, he asked me a, a few questions about him recently, and I, I, I didn't know he had been watching them, so it was uh, that, that, that was interesting, but people definitely appreciate them. I mean, a few hundred people is a lot of people. Imagine a few hundred people in this... Uh, Study group right now. Mm -hmm. You're right. I also had a question from a totally different tradition. He was like, You asked this question in this uh, Visuddhi Maga study group, and I'm like, Wow, you're watching this? 
it was interesting. Yeah, I think I think um, so. On the on YouTube, actually, you won't find a lot of like Viso di Merga related topics. I don't think, except ours, maybe, because it's pretty generally rejected by other traditions for some reason. Do you know what tradition the other person was in who asked about it? Goenka. Oh. It's a fairly similar tradition. So similar roots at least. Apparently they also reject the Abhidhamma and the Visuddhimagga for some reason. Oh. And a lot of the commentaries. Really? Let's not get political. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> good, 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 good want, call. Yeah, but I also wanted to say that you don't find uh, readings of the Visuddhimagga. You find may, maybe explanations or something like that. But I think it's also valuable to just have a reading of the text and then just talk about what you just, or what just have been read. Yeah, I also wanted to mention for anyone who would uh, uh, who's here that we we make like a very condensed uh, edit now, so it's only the important parts and no not big, no moderation, no nothing in it. So it's very concise and to the uh, yeah, basically very concise. So it's an easy easy watch or. Easy, easier. I think the ma two main points we can maybe um, summarize from today is that one, the intention is of course very important, but also how it affects others and how, yeah, basically that. Do you agree with that, Mante? My state of mind is it's always the most important. Yes. But I mean, you can do things with a pure mind, for example, even patting the head, but then that could lead to conceited parents. I think you mentioned that already. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's okay to... One, one thing you often see is um, doing things that might not be completely appropriate because as a means of creating familiarity and a sense of comfort for the people, uh, thinking that it will bring them closer to the Dhamma, maybe bring them closer to practice. Like, sometimes we might make some exceptions or some uh, allowances, thinking, well, if they come and practice, that would be the most important thing. We don't have to worry too much about these little details like a monk can't do this or a monk can't do that to some extent. I mean, you still have to be very careful, but there are some things like, um, like monks give, well, we give blessings, but monks will also give like little, what do they say in Sri Lankan, they call it, in Sinhala, they call it Pirit Nul. Yeah, Pirit Nul. Yes. Bracelets, these threads that they tie. And it's not so bad. I mean, it, it could be not so bad. It could also be very, very bad if you're presenting it in the wrong way. But sometimes these things, you can think of them as bringing people closer to the Dhamma, helping them remind them about the Dhamma, that sort of thing. Like someone asked this famous Sri Lankan monk about it. And he said about, about these, these things that they give, these protective amulets and so on. And he said, so... Uh, how did you put it? Some people under it was like something like some people understand the Dharma, Dharma really well, and you just teach it to them. But for some these people, they aren't ready to understand it. So you say, you say to them, and he pulled, he held up this pen, and he said, you you say to them, you take this and you keep it, and you you keep it very safe, and it will protect you or something like that. Meaning that you just give it to people because they're not that's all they're ready to appreciate. They're not, they're not ready to understand deeper than that. 
Yep, the Parita threads they have like uh, sometimes when you wearing them, it, it reminds you that you are a Buddhist and you're supposed to keep to the five precepts. So whenever you are doing something, see that it reminds you, okay, am I doing something wrong? Am I breaking the precepts? So it's usually so, that it's way. still not it's still not technically a thing that monks should be doing. Fine if people want to wear those things, but should a monk be tying them on? They I think no, but I, I mean, even Ajahn Tong did this. It's just a thing that people are familiar with, comfortable with, and it's not really that. It's not really that harmful. Potentially quite valuable. So, kind of like yeah, maybe monks shouldn't really do this, but it's not not a really harmful thing. Kind of like. Think- uh, Accepting the the culture, accepting the the expectations of people, and helping mm-hmm. to to use those things to draw them towards practice, or, or at least at least to wish them well and, and wish for them to find the right way to practice. And so. Yeah, there are references to Paritta threads. I think uh, even in the Jataka stories, Pacheka Buddhas. Offering them or giving them to lay people. I think the only real, well, the best thing in those lines would be to hand over the booklet on the end, maybe tell them following this will protect you or will lead you in a good direction instead of the bracelet, for example. Yeah, I mean, technically a monk shouldn't give things like that to lay people, but. It's just technically. Most important is why are you giving it and what are you doing it for? If you're doing it for gain and so on, that's bad. But still, I think it's it's best relegated to sort of a cultural thing that people expect. I, I You know, if people expect me to do it when I was with the Laotian monks, they did it all the time. And sometimes people would want me to do it for them. And it's, oh, okay, I do it. Because they kind of wanted it and expected it. I think where it really becomes a problem is when monks push these things and, you know, create new new rituals and, and t- where, where the monks give them some importance when it's instigated by the monks. I don't really believe that the puritnul or the bracelets are something that monks should encourage. If for nothing else, I mean, for two reasons. For one, it, it, it has the potential to focus lay people's attentions on things like magical protection, like worrying about their, their physical well-being and that sort of thing. But more importantly, because it, it, even if you do it with a pure heart, it's still very much susceptible to the kinds of things we're reading about in here, where monks do it for the purpose of gain. Do it thinking. I mean, it, it encourages this uh, ingratiating yourself with people. It makes it very easy to get caught up in elaborate ceremonies that are just for the purpose of, of uh, gain, material gain. I had a question, uh, meditation uh, practice related. I've been noticing that for the last few weeks, uh, maybe three, four weeks, uh, my mind is resisting a lot, the walking meditation. Um, It's very chaotic, very disturbed and agitated when I walk. But when I sit down, followed by the sitting meditation, it's much calmer. And um, should I just continue just the noting, the disliking, and just continue doing? Well, you should also note the liking and the sitting. Because the liking encourages the disliking. Okay. Got it. We're not practicing for the purpose of feeling calm feelings. If you like the calm feeling, you say liking. We feel calm, just say calm, calm. This will surely make, this will for sure make the walking feel worse because you don't get what you want. Right. Thank you, Bhante. How are the uh, at-home courses doing? Well, they're doing good. 
but not a lot, lot of people. I don't know. No, well, even a few is good. I only have four. I don't know. I think other has three. Hmm. Not a lot of people, to be honest. I, I I need to sign up for it still. So should should be one more person very soon. Uh, now that I'm covered from uh, sickness, I think I sh- should be able to get signed up. Thank you for doing it anyway. I appreciate that. I don't think I'm up to doing it. I was thinking I could add one hour a day or something. Maybe. Maybe in the future. I mean, I think um, it sounds better if you can say that uh, I'm doing it with Itada Mobiku, you know, the course, the at-home course, it doesn't sound as as great. I'm doing it with Edit. <laughs> so I think that's the one of the reasons. Or it's fine to me. It's, uh, the, people trust trust the monk more. I think. It's true. How about you, Bante? How many people are you teaching every day now? Well, we're down to 14, apparently. Two people left today. And tomorrow, 30 more are coming. So back up to 40-something tomorrow. Not tomorrow. Tomorrow, they just come, so... I will not meet with them. I will give them a talk tomorrow in the afternoon. But uh, I only meet with them the next day. Chris is here and Austin is here. And Chris is Chris has just today gotten permission to ordain. Sad, sad, sad. So the next step is we've given our pat. He's given his passport over to the secretary and. He's a really efficient monk. I'm sure he's already working out how to apply. How how is he bearing the weather, the uh, heat? I don't know. I think he's dealing with jet lag more than anything. He didn't really sleep on the flight. So Austin is there as well. Yeah. Yeah. You can't really come, I mean, you can, but you're not supposed to come a day early. So if you come a day early, you're not supposed to, you're not really going to be able to stay here the night before. So because their course starts tomorrow, Austin is staying in a hotel tonight. But Chris got a room. I'm excited with the prospect that there might be a group that might travel for a meditation course later this year. I hope that happens well you shouldn't come here as a group come here on your own i always tell meditators there's only two you should think there's only two people in this monastery me and you everybody else is just birds thank you for the feedback (laughs) but also our community would get stronger and stronger and more Let's say, let's call it stable or or just stronger if we meet in person. Yeah. I don't know about that. It's true. Maybe before. Um, the The craving and attachment to each other might increase. But also, it's a great support to have a Sangha, right? Uh, I don't know what you mean by Sangha. Sangha is in monk uh, Sangha or Sangha is in enlightened being okay. Sangha? Yes, and Sri Mangalo, the Sri Mangalo Sangha. Mm-hmm. So there's only two Sanghas. There's enlightened beings, uh-huh. and they're just a Sangha by virtue of being uh, who they are. And then there's the monastic community, which is called the Sangha. I don't know. What else do you mean by a sangha being a valuable thing? You, you're using it to mean a community. I don't. The Buddha didn't really say community is valuable. The Buddha said seclusion is valuable. Community, he was critical of. 
Well, I feel like we are pretty scattered around the world and then meeting once in a while. A few of us is good. Well, being around being around other people is, is good, but you shouldn't be particular about who. There's always lots of people here, whether you come alone or not. What you should be concerned with is that there are people who are ignoring you and reminding you to ignore them. That's what's important, is that we don't sit around and talk. I'm, I'm saying that as out of because apparently the meditators here like to sit around and talk. It's funny because they're all wearing these signs. They're, they, they're told to wear these, these name cards that say no speaking. Just a big, big thing that they, a pin that they have to wear that says no speaking and they all wear it. But apparently they still, they still speak, they still talk to each other. I mean, I'm, we are not intending to speak during the course. Buddhists have to be universal. Don't pick and choose. Bhante, I don't know if I misunderstood. So for the meditation, are there exact slots of time or one can go any period? So arrival dates are generally fixed. You can't really mm -hmm. just come any day you want. And I guess it has to do with the opening ceremony. So you have to do fewer opening ceremonies because they're a bit of a, a hassle. And it has something to do with cleaning the rooms. I don't really know. It's not the way they use not the way we used to do things at Jom Tong, but I think Jom Tong is doing it this way as well now. I'm not sure entirely, but I think they might have set dates as well. Yes, and if you send an email, um, they will tell you what dates are available for which month. And they'll give you two dates per month, and then you can choose. And there's a specific email for foreigners who apply, so it's on the website. Yeah, the issue for me is that in two days, the day after tomorrow is going to be about six hours of reporting. And then the next day as well is going to be about six hours of reporting. And it's going to slowly taper off to about two hours of reporting. And this is because everyone comes all at the same time and the new meditators have a lot of questions. And the beginner questions that I ask are a lot of questions as well. So for me, having people come staggered is, it would, be, would be a lot less uh, tiring. And not just tiring, but um, it just takes a long time, and the, there's the um, the translators have to be there for a long time as well. So there's something to be said for. Anyway, that's not how they do it here. They don't scatter it. You can't just come any day. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's how they do it. So if you plan to. Uh to a course, a um, face-to-face course this year. So this year it will be there for sure. The future's not sure at all. I might be dead soon. I think you made it sound like you're sick. We're all sick. We're all dying. Yes, yeah, it's true. That's why we count up birthdays, because we can't count down. If we knew the day of our death, we'd be counting down, not up. Do you think there is a place for lay, per lay person, lay people to teach at where you're at? No. No, they have strict rules here. Jom Tong as well. Uh, only ordained teachers. Here there's a bhikkhuni teaching, actually. There's a bhikkhuni who teaches uh, foreign meditators. Maybe Thai meditators as well, I don't know. So they changed the rules because I think they were in the past. Lay teachers? Not here. At Jom Tong? Mm -hmm. uh, well, at Jom Tong, there's two, set, there's two groups. There's the monastery and then there's this 
group of lay teachers out back who, right, who had special permission from Ajahn Tong to teach. And then it all kind of fell apart. But no, nobody else in the monastery. There were, there was, I think, a nun who wanted to teach, and Ajahn Tong gave her permission to teach, but he was kind of overruled by the monastic community, I think. Because they still. I mean, personally, if you, personally, I don't, I don't personally think it's wrong for lay people to teach. Obviously, I mean, edit and not add or teaching, right? Mm. But uh, wait, I mean, there is something. It's reasonable to understand why they think that and why it's a thing. I think um, what you could say is it's defensible in the context of a monastery, that this is a monastery. And I think that, that it, sorry, that is what they say, that that's not just conjecture, because there are lay teachers and lay teachers who, who are respected by this monastery and by Jomtong as well, but they have to go and start their own center. In the monastery context, only monks are allowed to teach. That's their policy. Why is that? Um, I don't know. It seems reasonable, I guess. Also, people don't like to get uh, like advice from Others who look the same as them, wearing the same similar clothes. <laughs> You're not so yeah, specific. it's kind of like the. I mean, it's it's obviously it doesn't the the uniform doesn't say anything, but it does make it easier. Like a person who doesn't know any better has to has to have some help in picking a teacher, right? They can't just go and try each one, each teacher until they find the one they like so they think oh this 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 teacher has all the monks rules is wears a robe and lives in a monastery there's there there's a greater likelihood that they are practicing practicing well and taking the instructions so much seriously then and yeah, they they are more likely to have strong teaching, even if you have a lay teacher who's a good teacher and a monk teacher who's a good teacher. The monk is still going to be uh, have have uh, advantages because of their austerity, because of the rigor, because of their connection with the monastic life, with with the Buddhist Buddhist teachings, with Buddhist culture. I mean, lay teachers still might have get married and play sports and that sort of thing and, and eat at all times of day and that sort of thing. It's not to say that they all do. I would say a lay teacher should, should keep the eight precepts for life if they really want to be a dedicated teacher, but not do other things. And then they're pretty much on par or could be on par. Because I still have the intention to teach at some point, but that would mean to become a monk, which is not possible right now. So I have to be very patient, maybe in a few years, 20, 30 yeah, years. Yeah. Look at my parents. They've changed a lot. Mm -hmm. There's hope. Yes. Well, if you keep practicing and become an arahant, nothing can force you to stay in lay life, whether you get uh, permission from parents or not. One way or the other, you stay as a lay person. I become an arahant by being a lay person. I might just die. I don't want to risk that. That would be a waste of teaching others. What do, you want, what do you mean by you don't want to risk that? Once you become an arahant, all your problems are solved. Yeah, that's true. There's no risk in it. Yeah, that was not a good choice of words. Lauer aspires to more than that. Just like the Buddha aspired to more than that. Right. 
Even Sariputta Moggallana, they aspired to more than that. Yes, maybe you can try what uh, Venerable Rathapala did. <laughs> I already thought of that, but I don't think I will do that. What, what did Venerable Rathapala do? Sanka, do you want to tell the story? I think, yeah, he stopped accepting food. Like, he was willing to die unless he was given permission to order it. He uh, laid on the ground. I think, was uh, it face down or face up? I don't know. <laughs> For several days, I think. Until he almost died. You know, I think another thing, too, when when struggling with that, uh, you know, getting permission from parents or any any time working with other people, uh, one, one of the things that actually le led me to finding out about Mahasati Sayadaw was um, the, the guy who wrote the um, introduction for the English translation, Daniel Goleman. He also, if you look on the back of uh, a lot of English Abhidhamma books, he uh, has a little endorsement on the back. He wrote a, uh, two books, Emotional Intelligence and Social Intelligence. And at the time I read them, I didn't know anything about about Buddhism, but you know, I, I was really impressed by them. And so I looked up his other works, and that's how I found out about Mahasi Sai. That was from him writing the intro. And he very, very subtly, very practically get, gives some good advice about reading other people's emotions, reading your own emotions and how to change them in a positive direction and uh, influence people in a positive way. And I didn't realize at the time, but a lot of the advice he gives is kind of pulled from meditation of first being aware of, uh, you know, the hindrances, you know, it may be more basic language. People might think of them as just being aware of your own negative emotions understanding the, the remedy to them when when you encounter them in yourself, and then learning how to read those in other people, and then learning how to show them how to remedy their, you know, negative emotions or, or hindrances. So, um, you know, that, that, that might be so, so, something good to keep in mind when, when talking to people is, you know, how, how to direct them in the right direction by sort of reading their uh, emotion or state of mind the best you can. All right. Well, that's all then for this week. Have a good week, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Bhante. 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 Thank you, Bhante.